Hello, in this video we're going to look at how to use static methods for procedural decomposition in Java. Topics we'll cover is first we're going to look at an example program and then we'll discuss how to make a method, how to call a method, and how methods help with improving the structure and the readability of your program, and finally a discussion on procedural decomposition. So let's start by looking at a, an example in NetBeans. Here we are in NetBeans, and all the instructions are in main. And as you can see, what it's doing is it's outputting my name in block letters. And I have already executed it, and over to the right, and you see what that looks like. I don't know if you see a problem or not, but we've got similar code repeating. Like I'm printing E here, and the exact same statements are executed here. Same with the Bs. So I'm printing a B here, and the exact same statements are executed here. Could we make this a little bit more efficient? So I've copied the source code over to Word so that I could highlight it, and everything in the blue is printing out the E. Everything in this brown color is printing out the B. It's happening twice. So I hope you noted that code duplication is a problem. And what if we wanted to create another word with more letters? What we're going to do is move these into methods. So, for example, on the next slide, I'm going to show the print B method. You write it once, you can print 100 Bs if you want to without having to duplicate the code. To give you an idea of how to write a method, let's start with looking at main. So you are now familiar with the header of main, public static void main, followed by the argument inside of parentheses. We then have a set of curly braces, and inside the curly braces are one or more statements. This is a static method. It doesn't return a value. There are no parameters. Void means it doesn't return a value. And I want you to notice how similar it is in structure to main. So here I have the method print B. And all I really did was put the logic on main printed the B, it's printing the lines, and then it's printing a parenthesis for the rounded part of the B. And it's inside a pair of curly braces. And I'm sure you can define print E. Uh, it'll be similar. So let's go ahead and modify the source code so that we're going to use the methods to reduce uh, the re repetition, the redundant code that we have. What I'm going to do is to look for where main ends, okay? And if you see, if you highlight the curly brace right after main, and I scroll down, you notice it's highlighted here. So this is the end of main, and this is the end of curl. So in between those curly braces, hit enter, and let's start writing our code. We're gonna start with public, static, void, and this time I'm going to call it print B. And we will need all of these and we'll keep expanding on what each of these terms mean. And I want to go ahead and close that. Did I already close it? Yeah, didn't need to close it again. It already wrote the close in there. And I'm going to come up here where I'm printing B and cut that out and paste that source code right in there. For Every method that you create, I want you to have a comment on what this method is doing. So printing B is adequate here. Don't need that code anymore. So the source code for both Bs are now outside of main. I've decided that I'm going to print the, the blank line in main instead of in the method, because what if I want to reuse this method and I don't want a blank line before the B? So I'm going to not copy the blank line code there. Let's, let's repeat this. So now I am outside of print B and before the closing brace for my uh, class, which is there, and 
I'm going to do exactly the same thing, public, static, void, and I'm going to call this print D. Now, E. <laughs> and when I hit enter, NetBeans is nice enough, again, to automatically give me that curling brace for the E. And here, here's my E. And of course, I do want that comment, printing E. So now when I look at this, uh, I'm only doing 1D, so I didn't create a method, but I don't need the E, and I don't need the code here for the B that's going to be executed by the method, and it looks like I missed my I. I had to pause and add my code back for my I, and so now to be honest, this will only print a D and a bunch of blank lines and an I as I have it written. So what we need to do next is learn how to call these methods. So after you've created your methods, the next thing you need to consider is where you're going to call a method. This slide goes over how to call a method. The syntax for this is the simplest syntax. So this is how you're going to call a method that is a static method, first of all. Void does not return an argument and has no parameters. It's this simple. You simply write the method name followed by parentheses and a semicolon. For example, print B. Let's take a look at that. Let's add this to our logic. Back in NetBeans, I have my print B and my print E methods already created down below. And now I'm going to make my method calls from main. So I, here's D being printed out, but now I want to print E. So I simply write print E. Okay. And now I want to print B. Print B. I print another B. Print B. The I, I'm writing the code for I here, but here I'm going to print E. And that should do it. Let's go ahead and test this. I'm going to come over to my output window and click the run button. And it worked perfectly fine. Exactly the same output, but a little bit more efficient code because I'm not repeating the similar code when I'm printing the B and the E. Now that we know how to call a method, let's talk about flow of execution or flow of control. This simply means the order that the statements will execute. So far, the programs you've written, the flow of execution has been sequential, which is the default flow of execution. In a few weeks, we will be covering the decision structure, the iteration structure. These structures will temporarily change the flow of execution, so it won't go in sequence. It might skip, it might come back up again, that's a loop. But in the end, everything starts in sequence. It might branch off or it might loop, but it returns back in sequence by the end. Calling a method also changes the flow of execution. So let's take a look at how this is being done in the program. Let's look at the flow of execution. Because of my class name is procedural decomposition example, when I execute this program, it's going to go into this class and look for the main. That's where it knows to start. The main is where your program execution starts, the main that is in the class that you're executing. So it's going to start in main, execute 14, 15, 16, 17, right in sequence, it's still going in sequence. Then it gets to line 24, which says print E. Well, that is a call to the method. So from print E, it jumps to where it finds the method print E and then executes each of these statements in order. As soon as it gets to the end of the method, it jumps right back up to 24 and then continues with the execution in sequence until it finds the next method. From here, 
it needs to find the print B method. It will jump then to the print B method and likewise continue the flow of execution until it gets to the end of that method or if there's a return. And we don't have any returns, so we're not returning values. Uh, as an aside, if you have a void, you're probably not going to have a return. So then it's going to jump back up where it made the call, which was line 30, and continue in sequence. Oh, okay, now we have a call to B again. Jumps back to where B, the method print B is defined, executes it to the end of the method, and then returns to 35 and continues in sequence, prints the I out in sequence, 49, 51, and then 52 is a call to another method. It jumps to that method, executes that in sequence, returns here. Here's the end of main. So the end of main is the end of your program. This is just ironic. Even though it's line 53 and my program continues, until line 70, the end of the program is here at the end of main. Let's take a look at flow of control and determine how the execution is going to occur in this program. So the name of the class is flow control test. And what's going to happen when the program starts executing is it's going to look for main. I want to point out, main doesn't have to be first. So the compiler knows to look for the main and put that first. So the first statement in main calls method C. So, but we find method C and here it is. And what's going to output is the statement printing method C. Then it's at the end of method C after executing that. It returns here. It's done with that statement. It comes to the statement that's calling method A. It will find method A. And then I'll put next starting method A. So I'm not going to write it all out, but C will output and then A will output. Let's take a look at another example. So here we have a class flow control test 2. When execution starts, it's going to look for main. And main is going to execute method 1. Here's method 1. And method 1 uh, says output boo. So boo will output. The next statement calls method 3. Method 3, then, is executed, outputting foo. When method 3 is done, it returns back to the statement where it was called here. And this is the end of that method. So then that returns back to where it was called, which is here. Notice it does not jump from method 3 to main, because main did not call method 3. Method 1 called method 3. It has to navigate in the same order when it returns. Okay, so method 1 is done and executes method 3. So we find method 3. Outputs foo. And that's the end of that. So it returns back to where it was called from, which is here. And goes to the next statement, which calls method 2. And method 2 is here, output 2. Next statement calls method 1. So method 1 now is going to execute. Now it puts boo. The statement after boo is a call to method 3. So now method 3 will execute. Outputs foo. That's the end of method 3. It returns from where it was called, which was method 1. Method 1 is done. Where was method 1 called from? Well, right here in method 2. So it returns here. Method 2 is done. So it returns from where it was called, which was right here. And we reach here, and that means that's the end of the program. Well, it's very easy to tell that I've got a chorus here that repeats. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle bells. Let's go ahead and indicate that as a method here. So these two right here will go into print refrain. Next, as I'm looking through the verses, not a lot of repeat there. But just like you may want to create a method for the D and a method for the I, even though it's not repeated, 
We did that for the structure to improve the structure and the readability of the program. Let's do that here too. So we're going to create a print verse one and a print verse two here. All that print verse one right here. Oops. We'll call that one print verse two. Now, if you actually look a little bit harder, the refrain is repeating. So let's take the refrain. I see it repeating. Let's call this print half refrain. So every time I call print refrain, what I'll do is two times print the half refrain. And there it is. I, I could repeat that a number of times for each one, but it all it already looks a little sloppy. Let's create the structure chart for this. I'm in PowerPoint. I'm going to go to Insert Smart Art. Choose this structure chart here. I don't want this one. And I'm going to do a print jingle. Let's say I call this print jingle. You do a lowercase p, print jingle. And then I'm going to call print verse one. Then I'm going to have a print refrain. And I'm going to have a print verse two. But after the print refrain, I'm going to have a print half refrain. Now, why did I put it there? Why put print half refrain here? Well, it is because print half refrain will be called by print refrain. So if you take a look at this chart here, okay? So print jingle will have calls to these three methods. Print jingle will not be calling print half refrain, print refrain. Every time you print the refrain, what happens? It prints two of the half refrains. So that is procedural decomposition for Jingle Bells. And for your program this week, I'm going to have you do something similar. So I hope this helped. Let's take a look at the source code based on the structure chart from the slide. Okay, so our class is named Jingle Bells. And what happens is it's going to look for main. Main is going to print verse 1. So here is our public static void verse one, and all the print line statements. Now it's gonna print a blank line, and it's gonna print refrain, and notice what the print refrain does. It makes two calls to print half refrain. So what the first call comes up, I'll push jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride one horse over the sleigh. Returns right here. Then the next statement executes, and that is repeated. After this print refrain is done, comes down here and prints a blank line, and then it repeats printing verse 2.